class, me again. Today, we'll be taking a deep dive into the very first complex multicellular creatures on the planet Athena. Though because I don't want this lesson to be a length of a YouTube rewind, I'll talk about some of the more defining features of these creatures and go over some of the other little bits in future lessons. Uh, sir? How does life actually come about? Good question! Yay. Well, to answer your question, nobody knows. But we do have a working theory. In chemistry, when you have two atoms, like hydrogen and oxygen, then they'd instantly bond with one another. Because atoms like to be stable, but water is weird. Instead of bonding with the chemicals that are put in the water, they just stay in the water. Just chill there. But what does this have to do with the emergence of life? The theory is that the chemical soup supplied by hydrothermal vents and the heat from them, and a few other little chemicals here and there, may supply conditions necessary to make some very, very basic life. But before we get into the creatures of this planet, we got to go over some important rules for evolution around this time. First is something that will bring up way too much throughout these classes, the square cube law. This one principle is extremely important to all forms of life. Plant, animal, even whatever this thing is. The square cube law is the relationship between surface area and volume. Volume is basically the stuff inside the creature, and surface area is the area you have for chemical reactions, which is basically doing stuff. Like gas exchange, photosynthesis, sight, heat laws, etc. Something else that's important around this time are niches. A niche is essentially the role an animal plays in its ecosystem, like producer, consumer, secondary consumer, decomposer, scavenger. I think you get the idea. Though, if more than one species is in one niche at a time, it results in one of those species saying adios from the gene pool. There are many ways that a creature can be structured, but there are some rules that a creature must follow. Number one, symmetry. Number two, uh, sir? Uh, what does symmetry have to do with animals? Everything, my boy! Okay, there's a few different types of symmetry. There's bilateral symmetry, where an animal is mirrored on two sides. Radial symmetry, where an animal is mirrored on a central axis, like a starfish. And there are some creatures that just have no symmetry at all. Weirdos. But why is symmetry important? Well, the way that these creatures are structured can show how active they are, behaviors, and unique anatomy. For example, pretty much every creature that walks is bilaterally symmetrical, as it's easier to walk when your limbs are parallel to each other. And most radially symmetrical creatures are sessile, meaning they're couch potatoes and don't really move. Okay, now that that's out of the way, let's actually get into some creatures. Our first set of creatures will be bilaterally symmetrical and will be living on the shallow part of the ocean. Our first creature will eat the large amount of stuff called the tritus that's just chilling on the ocean floor. This contains dead algae, animals, animal shit, dandruff, etc. It may be segmented, which means the repetition of morphological units. Each segment will have a pair of gills and a set of fins to pass water over those gills so it can breathe, and for moving around. They won't have any eyes because all they really have to do to get food is tap W and, well, they get food. So it may not need eyes. But they may have some vibration sensitive hairs and chemoreceptors on their back. So it can feel anything coming for it from ripples in the water and so it can pick up faint chemical signatures in the water. It may have a flat jaw that can scoop up any detritus from the floor, and some more chemoreceptors in the mouth for taste. For eating, it will have a simple gut that's just a tube that runs from one end of the animal to the other, also called the through gut. For the worm to smash, they may have a set of gametangia near its booty that'll release sex cells or gametes into the water. And those chemoreceptors may come in handy because since the gametes do give off a chemical signature, if one individual senses gametes in the water, they'll just release theirs. And after those two gametes unite, then boom, a new individual is born. But they will need a way to process all this information. So it may have a simple nerve cord going from the front of the animal to the back so it can carry the information. But 
Now there's one more problem for this creature. It needs a way to carry the oxygen from the gills to everywhere else in their body. So it may have a sac filled with red iron-based blood and muscular rings around it so it can pump the blood everywhere else. This is known as an open circulatory system where blood isn't continuously flowing throughout your veins but instead just pumped into certain cavities where oxygen can be exchanged. Not exactly the most efficient. And with that, we will call this creature Detritus Skiliki, the Detritus Worm. Next is our first creature that resembles an aquatic creature on Earth. Because of the universal properties of water and water physics, it's likely that aquatic creatures on other planets will resemble the basic shape of a fish because of the constraints put upon them by hydrodynamics. Just because these creatures do resemble a fish does not mean that they are any different from a fish. For starters, these creatures have six fins and a tail for maneuverability and propulsion. Six eyes gives them a very large field of view, and two wide mouths on the end of tubes that can catch algae and plankton on, on the surface of the water. A vibration sent of hairs on their backs and chemoreceptors in their mouths so they can taste what they're catching. Digestive, reproductive, and circulatory systems are basically the same as the worm though they may have a dedicated heart as swimming needs more oxygen than sliding across the ocean floor. Though because these creatures can swim, they need a way to react to whatever's in front of it. So it may evolve the nerve cord and a nerve cluster or ganglion in its head so it can process the information from the eyes and chemoreceptors so it can make out a response. Now this creature may sound very advanced for its time, but its eyes can only really see movement, and it's pretty small, only at 6 inches long. And it's very smooth brain. Like the worm, it just presses W to get food. And since there's always food around, they won't really need to stop swimming. So they'll have a similar respiration system to sharks on Earth, where they always need to move forward to pass new water over the gills to respirate. We'll call these fish Biplastoma, or tube mouth. Next is our second creature that resembles an aquatic creature on Earth. The squid is a meat-eating animal with six limbs on its back for locomotion, two limbs in the front with large suckers for grabbing meat, some limbs on its head to process the meat before it's ingested. It has four eyes on stalks that can swivel around. Though what's interesting about these squids is that they have a blind gut. A blind gut is basically a mouth with a stomach but uh, no booty. Instead, the mouth serves as both a mouth and a butt. Nasty. This may sound like a downside, and it is. This mostly means that it's hard for them to digest plant matter, as plants do have very hard tissues that make it difficult to digest without a proper through gut. And their eyes are not the greatest, only really able to see basic shapes, but they are kind of smart for this time, and they have chemoreceptors near their head so they can easily smell if there is any carcasses nearby for them, for them to eat. They're 9 inches long, tentacles included, which makes it pretty long for the time. And since these animals will be actively looking for and processing meat, and they swim, they'll need similar body systems to what we discussed with Diplostoma. Though since they are actively at the bottom of the ocean, they may evolve copper blood which is blue. Even though blue blood isn't as efficient as red iron blood like we have, it is better for deep ocean environments. Let's call this Jello Scavenger legal form, or squid form. Next is our first actual predator of Athena, the Tunnel Worm. This one's my favorite. This creature is about 9 inches long from end to end, and its bodily systems are similar to Diplostoma from digestive and nervous systems though they have blue blood instead of red. They have 10 limbs, 5 on each side of its body for moving underground. An exoskeleton to protect from another creature, which I'll get into soon, and from sharp rocks underground. A ganglium and nerve cord to process sensory information, and a four-part beak for processing prey items. They have four limbs on the front of their body with chemoreceptors that are used to sense, lure in, and grab prey. Spiracles around its head for respirating, and muscles around each spiracle to pass new water over them to respirate. They have six eyes around their head 
which gives them total 360 degree vision. And finally, they house their gametangia in their mouth. That way, they can just unite their gametes right then and there when two individuals of the opposite sex meet each other. Though it's only really able to see motion, and it's pretty dumb, but it is one of the most successful predators on the planet at this time. Cunicolum scalici, or tunnel worm, is what we will call the subterranean predators. Finally, let's get into the radially symmetrical creatures of Athena. First is the plant thing. It has many arms with thin frills for high surface area on each of its arms, for respiration and catching falling detritus from the surface to feed. And a potent quote head with four eyes that can only really distinguish light from dark. The head will move up to its arms and lick any detritus off them. And when it senses predators nearby with either its eyes, chemoreceptors, or vibration sensitive hairs, it'll move its limbs and head into its shell for protection. Every once in a while, it will shoot out gametes into the water via broadcast spawning. Broadcast spawning is where an animal shoots out an enormous amount of gametes into the water in hopes to unite to make a new individual. Seeing how sessile organisms can't move, this is the best way to reproduce for any sessile organism. It's got a blind gut, no blood since there's not much volume to this creature, and it doesn't have a dedicated brain. Instead, it has a nerve ring around its gut slash throat and a nerve cord moving up its neck and arms. Through the system, it makes it super smooth brain and can only react in basic ways. We'll call this animal radial testa, or radial shell. And lastly, before we get to the plants, let's go over the predator I hinted at with the tunnel worm, and is at the very top of the C4 food chain. This creature has two arms with frills similar to those of radial testa used for respiration, a reproductive surface, and its ass. A few eye stalks on top to make sure nothing eats these structures, and a shell to retract these structures into for protection. Next let's, uh, excuse me. Why does this radially symmetrical creature have a butt, but the last one just had a blind gut? But I can tell you, small child, this creature has a mouth underground, so it can eat its preferred prey, the tunnel worm. And to avoid filling the underground with poop, it has evolved to expel waste on the other side of its body. It's you. It uses four long limbs with chemoreceptors and vibration sensitive hairs to sense the tunnel worm nearby. When it does, it will grab it with the same arms and pull it to a chamber it dug for itself and impaled the creature with six spiked limbs for the kill and to break open its armor. Then its four part beak will open up to a real mouth and will process the worm with other arms and its beak to eat it. Because of the larger volume to surface area, there will be a simple heart and blood sac with purple blood for efficiency. Purple blood is the same as iron blood, but it uses two iron atoms to carry oxygen instead of just one. Around the digestive tract, there may be two nerve rings, one on top near the eyes and another near the mouth, so it can look for danger up top and prey below. We'll call this creature Stiloki which stands for Worm Eater. Okay, this class has gone on for a while, so let's quickly go through the plant-like organisms of this planet. Mobile algae. Tiny green boys that make up their own energy from the sun and minerals in the water through photosynthesis. Can move around slightly to try to avoid diplostoma. Reproduces by shooting gametes around itself. The algae are both male and female, but shoot out the male and female gametes at different times so it doesn't smash itself. Though since the ga algae are constantly surrounded by other members of its species, it will have no problem making more if they just shoot out their gametes in unison. Let's call this thing motile algae. That, that's pretty much what it is in Latin. Purple boy. It sits on the ocean floor and can't move at all. Asexually reproduces by making a tiny version of itself on its side, which will fall off later, and then will root itself into the ground once it finds a place to grow. 
Um, what is asexual reproduction? Okay, that's the last question for today. I don't have my coffee and I am tired. Asexual reproduction is where an animal can make offspring by itself. Basically cloning, though there is some genetic difference. And to keep itself from getting swept away from the current, it will have tiny little root structures to anchor itself to the bottom. Though the roots won't actually be able to suck minerals from the soil since they can easily get that from the surrounding water. Let's call this plant Propophyta, or purple plant. And finally, the chemo plant. This plant uses the chemical soup supplied by hydrothermal vents where life came from and will reproduce asexually by shooting off the tips of its leaves, which will then make a new individual, which will in turn float upwards and then drop itself once it finds another hydrothermal vent. Sentient with chemoreceptors, let's call these mini chemical reactors chemophyta, or chemical plant. Well, that's it for now, class. Next time, we'll see how animals will develop to the open niches in our early oceans. Though it may take a bit longer this time, since I don't actually have any of the models for the animals in Blender. Alright, bye! And don't forget your homework.